Okay, maybe we'll just get started tonight. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I have a few short announcements. My name is Jerry Carboni, I'm Library Director. Uh, the February 2nd, first Wednesday, with Michael Arnowit, Beethoven, Beethoven Sketchbooks, uh, has been rescheduled for Wednesday, June 1st at 7 p.m. here at the library. And due to an unavoidable schedule conflict, the April 1st Wednesday did Karl Marx predict the Cuban Revolution with Amherst professor Javier Corrales has been moved to April 8th, so it's the second Wednesday uh, in April. And our main sponsor, the Friends of the uh, Library, and the Vermont Department of Libraries supports the series statewide. Um, of course, none of these programs uh, would be done so well without our overall sponsor, the Vermont Humanities Council. And now I'd like to uh, welcome Bill Reed, who is a board member for the Vermont Humanities Council and the owner of Misty Valley Books in Chester, Vermont. Thank you. Isn't it wonderful that poetry can turn out the masses? Uh, we're grateful to the library. As, that is to say, the uh, Vermont Humanities Council is, is grateful to Brooks Library for the wonderful programs they do on Wednesdays, first Wednesdays. We're also grateful to the uh, Vermont Department of Libraries. And uh, I'm personally grateful to uh, Michael Palma because he has enlivened our bookstore on many occasions with his very engaging, witty, erudite seminars about various poetry. And he has done series on Robert Frost, Emily Dickinson, Robert Lowell, Elizabeth Bishop, Edwin uh, Arlington Robinson, Philip Malarkin, Wilfred Owen, Longfellow, Auden, and of course, Dante, and his own poetry, which is remarkable in its own right. He's, these seminars are full of wit, full of wisdom, and of considerable erudition. He has a wide-ranging intellect, as you will see, and he has groupies. People turn out <laughs> Misty Valley books for, uh, without fail on cold winter evenings to hear about their favorite poets. He is the author of a fully rhymed translation of Inferno, published by W. W. Norton in 2002, and reissued as a Norton critical edition in 2007. His 12 translations of modern Italian poets include prize-winning volumes of Guido Gazzano and Diego Valeri with Princeton University Press. He has served as a grants panelist and an expert evaluator uh, for the National Endowment for the Arts and is a former elector of the Poets' Corner at the uh, Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City. He is an associate editor of Gradiva and of the Journal of Italian Translation and poetry editor of Italian Americana. Several new translations and two new books of his own poetry are coming out this year, a full-length collection of his poetry called Begin in Gladness and a chapbook called Local Colors, which is a suite of poems on the six New England states. And this just in, since we're talking about Dante, uh, here is a quote from Adam Kirsch, a very good critic and a poet himself, he says, Michael Palma's Inferno does about as good a job with terza rima, every third line rhymes, in English as could be imagined. As a sustained poetic performance, it is splendid. And so is Michael. Welcome, Michael. You tell me when you can begin to hear me. Yes? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Bill, uh, for that uh, splendid introduction uh, and for making it almost impossible for me to live up to it. <laughs> but, <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for those kind words, and uh, I also wish to thank, of course, the uh, Vermont Humanities Council and um, Ellie White of the Vermont, Vermont Humanities Council um, for arranging this evening. Uh, to thank Bill also, not only for that uh, wonderful introduction, but also for having first suggested me um, as a um, speaker uh, for the first Wednesday series. And of course, I'd also like to thank uh, Jerry Carbone and the Brattleboro Public Library for uh, their own um, excellent participation in this, uh, as I have come to see, uh, to realize, excellent series. Now, um, I'll try to stick as close as I can to uh, what has been advertised in the brochure <laughs> for this evening. And uh, let me just give you a little bit of an overview then of what I hope to cover. Uh, in the next 45 minutes or so. 
Uh, first, I'd like to take you very quickly through a kind of history of Dante in English uh, translation. Uh, very, very um, selective, hitting only uh, a handful of the peaks, really. There have, in fact, been hundreds uh, of translations uh, of the Divine Comedy, and especially of the Inferno, uh, over the last uh, 230 or so years. The vast majority of which done by people you have never heard of, and for the most part, for very good reasons. <laughs> now, um, I also, uh, of the, the handful of, of high points that I, I want to touch on, I'm going to read from each of them uh, the first nine lines uh, of the first canto of the Inferno, just to give you some sense of the approach uh, that each of these selected translators takes, uh, and to give you a bit of the flavor, just a bit, obviously, uh, of each of those translations. Um, having done that, uh, then I will, of course, uh, devote the rest of my time to considering what we are um, here to consider, that, which is not only why are there so damn many of them, uh, but especially, of course, what it is about the Inferno uh, that provokes such frequent translation, and especially that recommends the poem uh, to our continuing attention. Uh, why should a, a very strange uh, and long and complicated uh, poem uh, with a great many um, now obscure references in it um, have such great appeal uh, to a contemporary uh, English-speaking and particularly American audience. Uh, obviously, Dante's Inferno is thoroughly embedded uh, in our cultural consciousness. It's one of those works of literature, such as Moby Dick or Don Quixote, that everybody, even those who have never read a word of it, uh, can tell you with reasonable accuracy uh, essentially what it's all about, uh, what goes on in it. And um, this is in a way kind of surprising when you consider what a late start Dante got in English. Uh, the Divine Comedy um, was composed uh, at the beginning of the 14th century, and yet no substantial portion of it was translated into English until the early 18th century. 400 years later. Now, this is not because no one in England had ever heard of Dante. Uh, as early as the late 14th century, uh, in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, uh, there is, in fact, a, a direct reference, uh, not only to Dante, but to a particular episode in the Inferno. And just to quote one stanza from Chaucer's The Monk's Tale in the translation of uh, Neville Coghill, he in despair sat on and slowly starved. Thus mighty once he met his end in jail. Fortune foreclosed on his estate and carved his greatness from him. Of this tragic tale, those who wish more and on a nobler scale should turn and read the great Italian poet, Dante by name. They will not find him fail in any point or syllable. I know it. Now, the tale in question, which is one of the several exempla that the monk recites uh, in the course of his tale in the Canterbury Tales, uh, is the story of Ugolino, uh, which comes very near the end of the Inferno, in which we will have occasion uh, to refer to uh, a couple more times uh, as we go along. So as early as the late 14th century, you have Chaucer telling his readers that there is a great Italian poet named Dante uh, and that they should read him which, of course, if they had no Italian, they didn't have any opportunity to do uh, for another nearly 400 years. Uh, the first substantial portion uh, of the Inferno to appear in English was once again the Ugolino episode, um, occupying the very end of Canto 32 and the first half uh, of 33 uh, of the 34 cantos uh, of the Inferno. This was done in 1719 uh, by a painter uh, and someone who has been described as the first English connoisseur, uh, whatever exactly that means, uh, named Jonathan Richardson. Uh, like many of those who were to follow him in the next century and a half, uh, he made no attempt to reproduce uh, the demanding and complicated rhyme scheme of the Inferno, uh, but instead uh, made his translation in blank verse, which is, of course, 
unrhymed uh, iambic pentameter, basically 10 syllables to the line, uh, with the stress falling uh, on the second and every other uh, alternate syllable thereafter. Classic example in English of iambic pentameter being famous line from Thomas Gray's Elegy in a Country Churchyard, the paths of glory lead but to the grave. Uh, another even more ex famous example, perhaps the most famous line of poetry in the entire English language, uh, one with an unstressed 11th syllable at the end, um, is the line from Hamlet's soliloquy, to be or not to be, that is the question. So um, the meter was reproduced, but as I say, no attempt whatsoever made to reproduce the rhyme scheme. The first complete translation of the Inferno into English appeared in 1806, done in Britain by an Anglican clergyman named Henry Carey, C-A-R-Y. And um, like Richardson before him, um, he did not rhyme, he wrote in blank verse. In fact, frequently the name of John Milton is invoked uh, in connection with Carey's translation. Um, obviously Miltonic as opposed to Dantesque um, features uh, of Carey's translation are the use of blank verse rather than the tertiarium uh, of Dante's original, and also the frequent use of enjambment, which is uh, the ending uh, of a syntactical unit, usually a sentence, in the middle of a line, uh, rather than Dante's much more frequent practice of end stopping, that is having the end of uh, a sentence coincide with the end of a line, usually every third line. Uh, in, in his tercet or three-line structure. So uh, in those ways, uh, in those superficial ways, Carey's translation more obviously resembled Milton's Paradise Lost than it did Dante's Inferno. Um, now to give you, as I say, just a bit of the flavor of Carey's version, here are its first nine lines of Canto I. In the midway of this our mortal life, I found me in a gloomy wood, a stray gone from the path direct. And e'en to tell it were no easy task, how savage wild that forest, how robust and rough its growth, which to remember only my dismay renews in bitterness not far from death. Yet to discourse of what there good befell, all else will I relate discovered there. Now, it's a bit naughty, obviously. It helps to have the text in front of you to piece out exactly what he's saying. Uh, it's hard, perhaps, to pick up on the fly. But I think you can hear, even in, in that brief passage, um, that some of the, the virtues uh, of Dante's uh, original have been captured there. Uh, the swift pace, uh, the relative clarity uh, and directness of expression uh, are essentially preserved in Carey's version. Um, overall, it still is highly regarded, not merely uh, because it was the first, but uh, for its own intrinsic merits. Uh, it's still frequently reprinted, in fact, and not only, I dare say, because it's been in the public domain uh, for well over a century. Now, um, the first major translation of the Divine Comedy into English done by an American was, of course, the one by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Uh, of which the first component, the Inferno, appeared in the year 1867. Again, uh, to give you just a taste, here are the first nine lines, the same nine lines uh, as I've just read from Carey in Longfellow's version. Midway upon the journey of our life, I found myself within a forest dark, for the straight pathway, for the straightforward pathway had been lost. Ah, me, how hard a thing it is to say what was this forest savage, rough and stern, which in the very thought renews the fear. So bitter is it, death is little more. But of the good to treat, which there I found, speak will I of the other things I saw there. Now, Longfellow's translation uh, continues to have its admirers uh, down to the present day, but I have to confess uh, that I've never really been one of them. Um, Longfellow's translation could also be described as Miltonic uh, in some ways, not the same ways uh, as Carey's. 
um, I think particularly uh, in this connection of the famous observation of Milton's style in his late poetry, especially Paradise Lost, that he writes English as if it were an inflected language. Uh, that is to say, if it were a language like Latin or Greek in which the endings of words indicate whether they are subjects or objects, and therefore word order uh, is not really relevant. A famous example from Paradise Lost is the line, him who me diso uh, he who him disobeys, me disobeys. Uh, which syntactically means, he who disobeys him, disobeys me. So, um, as you see from the last line I just quoted, speak will I of the other things I saw there. Um, in this way, Longfellow verges on the Miltonic rather more often, uh, I think, than is really called for. And um, in many ways, I find his translation clotted uh, with a sort of inversion and archaism and missing those very qualities of clarity and speed uh, that Carey was so much more effective uh, at capturing. Uh, Longfellow's translation is, I think, rather peculiar. Admittedly, Dante's uh, Inferno is much more peculiar, but it's not peculiar in the same ways uh, as Longfellow's translation. Now, in the 20th century, um, British translators have tended, actually, to preserve the rhyme and the meter. Uh, of the poem, and the, and the two best known of these, uh, published uh, within a rather short um, time, were Lawrence Binion's in 1934 and Dorothy Sayers uh, in 1949. Uh, again, just to give you a brief taste, uh, here is Binion. Midway the journey of this life, I was aware that I had strayed into a dark forest, and the right path appeared not anywhere. Ah, tongue cannot describe how it oppressed. This wood so harsh, dismal, and wild, that fear at thought of it strikes now into my breast. So bitter it is, death is scarce, scarce bitterer. But for the good it was my hap to find. I speak of the other things that I saw there. Now, uh, again, th this is a translation that still has its admirers. Uh, in individual passages, it can be quite beautiful, and it does. Uh, to its credit, uh, preserve the rhyme and the meter uh, of the original. But as I think you can hear in that brief passage, it is rather fustian, uh, it, it is overstuffed, and uh, Binion seems by and large to be operating on the unspoken principle that because the poem was written 700 years ago, uh, you can translate it uh, by and large in the English that was current 700 years ago. Uh, which is an arguable proposition at the very least. Uh, Sayers is a bit more lively, at times inventive, at times um, a bit off the deep end, but I think also prone uh, to some of those same faults, as again you can hear in, in the opening nine lines. Dorothy Sayers is, of course, uh, also know, very well known to another constituency of readers as the author of the uh, Lord Peter Whimsey uh, detective novels. So her version begins, Midway in our life's journey, I went astray from the straight road and woke to find myself alone in a dark wood. How shall I say what wood that was? I never saw so drear, so rank, so arduous a wilderness. Its very memory gives a shape to fear. Death scarce could be more bitter than that place. But since it came to good, I will recount all that I found revealed there by God's grace. And better, clearly, uh, and also clearer than, than Binion, and, uh, and uh, certainly more so than Longfellow. But uh, again, over the long haul, uh, I think that there are too many resorts to uh, a kind of corner cutting, uh, whether it be through inversion of natural word order uh, or the use of archaic expressions um, that, that keep the translation from being uh, as successful as it might otherwise have been. Now, in the United States, there has been less tendency to preserve the full uh, rhyme and meter of the original. Uh, there's been much more modification and at times outright abandonment uh, of the metrics uh, of Dante's poem. The two most famous translations of Dante, done, uh, of the Inferno, done by Americans in the 20th century, 
are, of course, uh, both done by writers who had established themselves in their own right as poets uh, before undertaking their translations. Uh, two translations published exactly a half century apart, one in the middle, one at the end of the 20th century. And I refer, again, of course, uh, to John Chiardi's 1954 version and to Robert Pinsky's, published in 1994. Now, um, Chiardi's modification was simply to drop the linking rhyme. Uh, perhaps this is as good a place as any to explain for those who may not be familiar with it exactly what the terza rima uh, format uh, or triple rhyme format of the inferno is. Uh, the rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B, C, B, C, D, C, uh, and so on, in which the middle line of each tercet uh, or three line stanza then serves uh, to rhyme with the, the first and third lines uh, of the next stanza, and so on, until you come to the end of each canto. And they vary in length, by the way, uh, between 115 and 157 lines over the course of the poem, the 34 cantos adding up to uh, about 4,800 lines uh, altogether. Now, it's the linking rhyme, of course, that uh, is the problem for translators. Uh, and so uh, Chiardi's expedient was simply to drop it uh, altogether, uh, to leave the middle line of each tercet unrhymed and to rhyme only the, the first and third. So to backtrack just a bit for those who want to hear it, here's Sayers. Midway th uh, this way of life we're bound upon, I woke to find myself in a dark wood where the right road was wholly lost and gone. I me, mean, how hard to speak of it, that rude and rough and stubborn forest, the mere breath of memory stirs the old fear in the blood. It is so bitter, bitter it goes nigh to death. Yet there I gain such good that to convey the tale I'll write what else I found therewith. Uh, an excerpt that I think uh, rather better than Charity's did lives up to my characterization of it. Now, in Charity, I think you do find a signal advance. Uh, over much of the rest of what I've read. It is, again, clear, straightforward, very lively. Um, it, it has its weaknesses, but um, I, I don't really want to dwell on those at the moment, that uh, if you had to pick a, a translation that attempts to reproduce the Inferno as a poem, um, it's no surprise that Chiardi's has been the most frequent pick uh, for people put in that position. Now, uh, the Pinsky version chooses uh, a somewhat different way of getting around the strict terza rima. Uh, it uses off rhymes uh, as frequently as not, uh, more frequently, in fact, than not. And uh, more tellingly, it, it makes no attempt to preserve um, the line-by-line -line, uh, equivalency uh, with Dante's original. Um, Pinsky's version, actually, its lines tend to be about... Um, uh, its cantos tend to be 10 to 15 lines shorter, uh, on average, uh, than the original. So that his entire poem is actually several hundred lines shorter. Um, he explains that uh, as he began to translate, he found himself padding out the lines to make them come out uh, equally. And then he, he decided to abandon that uh, and simply to translate uh, as he saw fit, uh, trying to keep the off rhymes in place and not worrying about the stanza, tercet by tercet matchups. So instead of reading you his first nine lines, uh, I will read you instead his first six in a bit, uh, which are the equivalent to Dante's first nine. Midway on our life's journey, I found myself in dark woods, the right road lost. To tell about those woods is hard. So tangled and rough and savage that thinking of it now, I feel the old fear stirring. Death is hardly more bitter. And yet to treat the good I found there as well, I'll tell what I saw. Now, in fact, uh, there is not an exact rhyme uh, anywhere in that passage. And um, uh, as I've uh, suggested, um, there is no line-by-line -line equivalency. There's frequent enjambment. Um, there are many virtues uh, to Pinsky's translation, but certainly those who are uh, looking for a poem that gives them the feel 
uh, of Dante's original, uh, I think, will not really um, find that in Pinsky's version. Now, um, moving from this very brief overview, uh, other than simply to say that Opera Pinsky, uh, Le Deluge, uh, the Pinsky, in a sense, uh, opened a dam, opened a floodgate, uh, and translations uh, of Dante have appeared roughly uh, at the rate of one a year uh, in the 15 or so uh, years since then. And again, uh, one might reasonably ask, why is this? And um, this is something I think that nowadays, given the spate of translations, almost every translator begins by addressing. Uh, in, my, in the original publication of my own translation uh, in 2002, the very first paragraph of the introduction addressed that very issue. Uh, in a new translator's note that I wrote for the Norton Critical Edition, which appeared in 2007, uh, I likewise began uh, by addressing that very point. And let me just read you uh, that opening from the, uh, the critical edition's preface. Dante's Inferno is without a doubt the most frequently translated work of our time. Over the last decade or so, new versions have appeared in the United States at the rate of about one every year. Why are there so many? It is possible to produce a definitive translation of a novel, even a great novel, but poetry with its rich and complex use of language and its tight interweaving of form and content, is a very different matter. One can easily imagine five or even ten translations of a single Rilke sonnet, all of them good in their own way, all of them reasonable approximations of at least some aspects of the original, and all of them substantially different from one another. With the Inferno, we are dealing not with a mere 14 lines, but with 4,700 with a book-length poem that not only tells a vivid and intricate story, but also engages dimensions of religion, morality, history, politics, myth, philosophy, psychology, and the author-protagonist's personal experiences. In addition to all of this, it is a work in which matters of tone and diction and of form and structure are of critical importance. A work of such stunning artistry and complexity creates space enough not only for the translations already in the field, but for undreamt of others as well. So I think one of the reasons that would seem to militate against the astounding popularity of the Inferno uh, is in fact one of the reasons that explains why there are so many translations of it, basically that it's a poem. And uh, as I've tried to suggest there, given its uh, multi-dimensionality, uh, there is much more range uh, of possibility uh, in, in translation of a poem uh, than there is in, say, uh, a work of fiction that does not seek, like, say, Joyce's Ulysses, uh, to employ um, poetic resources uh, in the course of its uh, narrative. Now, uh, a translation of uh, Dumas' uh, The Three Musketeers, for example, can stand for a century or so uh, until its archaisms uh, begin to grate. Um, but uh, with Dante, uh, you're dealing with a very different situation. We all read essentially the same Three Musketeers, uh, but given how much of what is going on uh, in the Inferno, I think many uh, times we read very different uh, Infernos from one another. And um, the fact that it is a poem, I think, is what has led so many people to tackle it, uh, to try to improve upon uh, the poetics uh, of previous renderings. And certainly, uh, this had uh, a, a very large role to play in my undertaking, my own translation. Uh, when Pinsky's appeared, uh, and when I discovered the method that he had employed, uh, as I've briefly outlined it, um, I confess I was very disappointed. Uh, knowing Pinsky's own poetry, uh, knowing his formal mastery, uh, I had expected and hoped that he was going to do a translation in full, uh, Terza Rima. Uh, and when he turned out not to do so, uh, I felt that, uh, in a sense, uh, the translation that I had been waiting for and expecting uh, had not arrived. At the time, I was very disappointed uh, about that. I, I'm not anymore, because <laughs> if, tra if, tra if Pinsky uh, had done the version that I wanted him to do, uh, I never would have done mine. So it was, in essence, uh, well, to quote uh, uh, 
a, uh, a line of Bob Dylan's that I've always admired back in the mid-70s when uh, one of his albums had just come out and he was interviewed and asked why he had made the record. He said, because no one else was making the music that I kept hearing in my head. And uh, essentially, um, that was how I felt about the Inferno. No one else was making the sounds uh, in translating the Inferno that I kept hearing uh, when, it, when I would look at the original. So um, I guess in fairness, uh, having exposed everyone else uh, to your evaluation, let me read you at the moment uh, the first nine lines of my version, again, to give you some sense of what it was that I was going for uh, in translating the Inferno. Midway through the journey of our life, I found myself in a dark wood, for I had strayed from the straight pathway to this tangled ground. How hard it is to tell of, overlaid with harsh and savage growth, so wild and raw the thought of it still makes me feel afraid. Death scarce could be more bitter. But to draw the lessons of the good that came my way, I will describe the other things I saw. I hope I haven't been unfair there. I hope I haven't put in the reading itself a little more English, so to speak, on the ball. Uh, than I did with some of the other versions. But uh, as I think you can hear, uh, what I wanted to do was to produce a version of the Inferno that would be fully rhymed, uh, that would reproduce the Terza Rima and others of Dante's effects where they were of particular relevance uh, along the way. Parallel parallelisms of phrasing, um, bits of alliteration, and so on. Uh, things that is distinct from uh, what the words were actually saying, which, of course, uh, I sought to reproduce as faithfully as possible in every line uh, of the translation. But to do this, um, and, and at the same time, to try to produce a version that would also be as clear uh, and as straightforward and as readable as possible. Um, it's often been maintained uh, by translators that these are antithetical goals that uh, you, you have to sacrifice clarity um, to uh, achieve the, the form, or that you have to sacrifice the form, as, as Americans more frequently have it, uh, in order to achieve clarity. Uh, I thought that it might be possible to achieve both, and at the very least, that was what I wanted to attempt uh, in doing my own version. Now, as I've suggested, there are a number of reasons why the Inferno ought not to be uh, as popular as it is, one of them being the fact that it is a poem uh, in a culture that is uh, essentially poetry averse. <laughs> and um, also, of course, it's long. Um, it, it runs, um, as I said, nearly 4,800 lines, which, uh, of course, uh, just as it's being a poem makes it popular with, tra uh, with translators, the fact that it's long would make it more popular uh, with readers, um, who often obviously want a, a, as much poundage uh, for their money as they can possibly get, and, um, and who would prefer, obviously, as, as they have it here, a full-length narrative uh, to a shorter uh, poem that did not give them characters uh, and drama. Uh, and uh, violent interactions and all of the other nifty stuff uh, that goes on all over the Inferno. Um, certainly, militating against its presumed popularity is the fact that it is filled with arcane references. Um, biblical uh, allusions, which of course until uh, the last hundred years or so were, were not so arcane, but nowadays uh, need to be annotated as thoroughly as the mythological and the uh, Aristotelian philosophical uh, and even the 13th century Florentine uh, political references that fill up the poem. So um, to, to, in order to read the, the Inferno, you have to encounter a, a lot of information that um, requires you to go outside the poem uh, to fully comprehend it. Uh, many Homer translations uh, are unannotated. Um, 
an, an un unannotated translation of Dante uh, is almost unimaginable. And uh, of course, it's also, when you think about it, a very strange poem. Um, some extremely odd things happen in it. Um, it has all sorts of digressions uh, and set pieces. Uh, in the middle of Canto 20, uh, Virgil takes something like 40 or 50 lines to explain to Dante how his city of Mantua uh, came to be founded, uh, something that has little or nothing to do uh, with the main thematic thrust of the poem, as do a number of other passages along the way. Uh, obviously, um, also, uh, the Inferno was for Dante a way of settling scores. Um, everyone will have noticed that hell is disproportionately populated by 13th century Florentines. Uh, or at least, uh, those are the ones that Dante speaks to. Uh, obviously, there are many thousands of other people there uh, for whom he has a, with whom he has a language barrier. Uh, but he does speak to many of his own kind, and um, not only does Dante consign uh, many of his enemies uh, to hell, uh, not all of them were even dead uh, at the time he put them there. So it is a chance for him to work off a lot of personal grudges that really uh, are of no particular interest or concern uh, to a contemporary reader. Uh, but strangeness, uh, and again, take the examples I gave you before of um, Don Quixote uh, and Moby Dick, uh, is certainly not an impediment to literary greatness. In fact, some might maintain, and perhaps with justice, that it is a, um, a necessary component uh, of, of true literary greatness. The biggest problem many would have with uh, the Inferno is, of course, that it espouses a particular doctrine. Um, medieval Catholicism, um, which many readers nowadays, including many Catholics, would find rigid, harsh, uh, antiquated. Uh, the limbo canto, for example, canto four, uh, which is filled with worthy um, and eminent people uh, who had the misfortune not to be baptized Christians. Uh, some of them simply by an accident of chronology, having lived before Christ. They had no opportunity to be Christians, but tough. Uh, they are not punished except by being deprived of heaven in the sight of God. But obviously, uh, all of their virtue in the end uh, did not achieve them salvation. Um, and if this isn't enough, Dante uh, adds a few twists uh, of his own. Uh, people coming upon the Inferno for the first time are quite surprised, uh, if not shocked, uh, to discover his hierarchy uh, of sin. Uh, the, the violent, even murderers, are relatively lightly punished uh, in comparison with others, such as forgers, liars, even flatterers, uh, who are put in, in much lower circles of hell uh, than are the violent and the murderers. Uh, there's an explanation for all of this. Uh, in Canto 11, uh, Virgil explains to Dante uh, that those actions that we have in common uh, with the lower orders of creatures, with the animals, uh, are punished less severely uh, than those that require human reason. Uh, that a perversion uh, of the God-given gift of reason given in order that we may know and love and serve him, uh, is a worse offense in Dante's hierarchy than killing people, uh, which is, of course, uh, likely to strike any contemporary reader as bizarre, uh, to think that uh, you're going to be punished more severely for all eternity uh, for simply saying no uh, when asked, uh, do these genes make my ass look big? <laughs> Uh, than you would be for killing somebody, uh, by any reckoning, is uh, strange, uh, to say the least. But, uh, of course, there are many more reasons uh, why the Inferno is popular. Uh, not necessarily all of them admirable. Obviously, one of them is the fact that it's a very lurid and sadistic work uh, when you come right down to it. Uh, a lot of ugly and violent things go on in it. Um, 
in fact, there is a, uh, a program on the Discovery Channel uh, right now, it was on this morning and this afternoon, called The Gates of Hell, in which the Inferno is described as, quote, Christian porn. <laughs> and um, while there are no explicit sex acts described in the Inferno, uh, there is a kind of pornography of violence and a kind of pornography of sadism uh, that does occur in it. Uh, the most famous um, instance uh, or, or aspect of it being the so-called contrapasso, uh, that is, the, the fitting of the punishment to the crime. Uh, I don't know that Chester Gould ever read The Inferno, but certainly uh, many of the villains in his classic strip, Dick Tracy, uh, met uh, suitable ends as when the, uh, during World War II, uh, when the Brau, who was a, a German agent, uh, after having been arrested, uh, leaped out a, a window of an upper story uh, of the, the building in which he was being interrogated uh, and landed on and was impaled on a flagpole that was flying the American flag. So, um, the Contrapasso um, is explained uh, at the end of Canto 28 by uh, the troubadour poet Bertrand de Born, uh, who is uh, a himself a notable instance of it. I stayed to watch the multitude below and saw a sight that I would not have revealed without more proof that it was really so. But knowing that I saw it, I am steeled by conscience, a just man's support and stay whose sense of right protects him like a shield. Truly I saw, as I can see today, a headless body with the others there trudging like them along the dismal way. It held its severed head up by the hair, swinging it like a lantern in the night as it cried, oh me, and caught us with its stare. Out of itself it had made for itself a light. There were two in one and one in two. How this could be is known to him who in his might ordains it. When he stood right under us beneath the bridge, he held his arm up straight to bring us closer, so we would not miss these words. Behold my miserable fate, live man among the dead in your journeying Try to find another punishment so great. No, I am Bertrand de Born, so you may bring news of me back with you. I am the one who counseled wickedness to the young king. Because of me, the father fought the son. Ahithophel did no worse when he instigated wickedly with King David and Absalom. Two who were one by me were separated. I carry my brain separated from its source inside this trunk. In me is demonstrated how the law of retribution takes its course. Now, um, another reason, I think, for the great popularity uh, of the Inferno, and a rather more respectable one, um, is the fact that it is a journey. Uh, like Homer's Odyssey, for example, as we read the Odyssey, we're intrigued, wondering, uh, what is Odysseus going to find uh, at his next landing point? Uh, what's going to happen next? Uh, and as we read uh, the Inferno, I believe we have the same feeling. Um, who will be in the next circle? How will they be punished? Um, what famous figure from history or myth uh, will suddenly appear and speak a few lines of superb poetry uh, to explain how he or she came to be? in this dreadful condition. Um, the poem, needless to say, uh, is brilliantly written uh, in its style, and as I've tried to suggest, uh, in its form. Uh, there are vivid details and descriptions throughout, including such set pieces as the, um, the founding of Mantua, previously alluded to, but also any number of extended similes, some of them running for 20 lines or more, uh, a number of comparisons uh, from all kinds of areas uh, of human experience, including even uh, household and domestic life uh, in the 13th century. So you get some sense of, of what day-to-day -day existence was uh, at the time that Dante was writing. There's also, which may surprise some people to learn, uh, some humor uh, and some sly wit uh, along the way uh, in the Inferno. Now, that's not why the entire poem is called the Divine Comedy, of course. 
uh, it's a comedy uh, in the classical sense of the term because the protagonist goes from bad fortune to good uh, because it has a happy ending. Uh, the whole thrust of the Divine Comedy is to suggest that uh, for those who are still alive, it's never too late to straighten up and fly right. Uh, it's never too late uh, to atone, to confess, uh, and to be forgiven, and ultimately, therefore, to achieve salvation. Uh, but there is humor, some of it quite boisterous, uh, and uh, even a, a touch scatological, particularly in the 21st and 22nd cantos, uh, where Dante and Virgil uh, encounter the, the troop of devils. Um, the 21st canto ending with the famous reference in which the leader of this particular troop uh, assembles his minions uh, and calls them to order with a trumpet blast, uh, which is not played, however, upon a musical instrument, uh, but instead... <laughs> They all turned round to face left on the spot, first pressing their tongues between their teeth en masse to signal their leader, who sounded the charge, but not as you'd think. He made a trumpet of his ass. <laughs> so, um, there's also um, constant uh, inventiveness uh, in the punishments. Um, the the wood of the suicides being a classic, classic example that I'm sure uh, many are familiar with. Um, more than almost anything, the Inferno appeals to us because of its fascinating characters uh, and dramatic encounters. And this, I think, is what most people think of uh, when you say Dante's Inferno to them. Uh, you, you think of some of the more famous uh, characters and encounters, Paolo and Francesca uh, being among the more notable. Uh, Pierre della Vigne uh, in the Wood of the Suicides with his impassioned plea uh, for vindication of his good name back on earth. Um, the proud Faranata uh, uh, about whom, uh, who, who looks about him, uh, as Dante famously says, as if hell itself were contemptible in his sight. Um, Ulysses, that is, uh, Homer's uh, Odysseus, uh, who in one of the uh, Inferno's justly most famous passages uh, gives a speech uh, explaining how he came to be in hell, uh, explaining um, how he and his mariners sailed beyond the pillars of Hercules and past the boundaries of the known world uh, in their mad quest uh, for adventure and discovery, uh, a passage that, of course, uh, inspired Tennyson's uh, great monologue, Ulysses, hundreds of years later. Although, interestingly, uh, the whole point, the whole thematic thrust of Tennyson's poem is the direct opposite uh, of the point that Dante is making, uh, where Dante's Ulysses is condemned for overreaching. It is that very refusal to, to be contented uh, with the, the limits uh, that have been placed upon us, that refusal to live like the beasts of the field, uh, but the insistence on discovery and knowledge uh, that in Tennyson's eyes uh, makes Ulysses great. But I think ultimately, more than anything else, what uh, is really fascinating uh, about the Inferno is the constant tension uh, whether intended or not, uh, that is going on in it between the belief system that it advocates and adheres to and the human impulse uh, to compassion uh, that keeps welling up all over the place. Now, um, thematically speaking, uh, the official version, of course, is that um, these outbursts of compassion on Dante's part, are slips. They go against the grain uh, of the poem's intent. Uh, Virgil, uh, at several places, most notably in the 20th canto, when, um, or is it the 19th, pardon me, the 19th canto, uh, when Dante sees the soothsayers with their heads twisted around backward. Uh, their particular sadistic punishment because they dared 
to usurp the power that God alone has to see into the future is to have their heads twisted around and to look eternally behind them uh, rather than forward. Uh, and Dante, uh, weeping perhaps as much for himself uh, as for the soothsayers when he sees this grotesque perversion of the human form, uh, is moved to tears. Uh, and Virgil immediately rebukes him for this, uh, saying in effect that who are you uh, to feel sorry for those who, that God has condemned and in effect then to dispute God's judgment, uh, to second guess God, uh, to say in effect God should not have done what he did. And yet there are other times in the poem when Virgil not only seems to allow and even endorse Dante's compassion for some of the souls he sees, but even almost to compel it, uh, as in the 16th canto, uh, when he says that uh, men are approaching uh, that you must treat with respect. So there is, I think, a kind of dynamic tension uh, animating the poem from first to last uh, between what we're supposed to feel and what we really feel. Now, um, this may remind you of, um, again, of John Milton in Paradise Lost and the fashion 200 years ago in the Romantic era uh, to make the claim, as Blake and Shelley and others did, uh, that Milton is of the devil's party without knowing it. Uh, that Milton had created a god in his own image, uh, cranky, uh, authoritarian, um, shut up and do what I tell you, uh, and that Satan uh, is the much more attractive figure of the two. Uh, which may be a way of saying um, that just as these translations uh, that I have uh, run barefoot through at the beginning of this discussion uh, are also doing consciously or unconsciously, that if you think about it, uh, translation is a kind of, uh, among many other things that it is, a kind of adapting of something alien into uh, terms uh, in which we can accept it. Uh, that whether we mean to or not, we tend to produce uh, versions uh, of foreign literature that consist with our own values, literary and um, even human. And um, so whether Milton intended it or not, this was the paradise lost that um, the romantic poets uh, and others read uh, and wanted to read. Uh, and there is uh, something of a movement afoot nowadays to suggest that the Inferno is a deliberately subversive poem, that it is really the compassion uh, and not the extreme and harsh doctrine which forbids that compassion uh, that Dante is subtly endorsing. Uh, obviously, he could not have done so overtly uh, at the time. So whether this is so or not, uh, obviously it is impossible to determine at this date without corroborating evidence uh, from Dante himself. It is an intriguing theory, but again, um, who, can, uh, who can possibly determine with any definitiveness uh, whether there is any validity to it or not. But it does, uh, nonetheless, I think, highlight what is the central point of what keeps the inferno uh, alive and relevant uh, now and I dare say for all time to come. Like every other work of great literature, it is ultimately a human document, uh, a document that not only uh, recreates but affirms uh, what it is to be human uh, in the deepest meaning uh, of that term. And uh, I think it, it is the compassion uh, as much as it is the condemnation that shines through so in a sense, to, to bring us full circle and, and to give you much better than any secondhand description of it could, uh, some sense of what I mean by the humanity of the poem, uh, let me end where we began in 1719 uh, with the Ugolino episode um, from the Inferno, which um, begins, as I said, at the end of Canto 32 uh, and runs into the middle of Canto uh, 33. And since I'm just going to read this and be done, let me thank you in advance then uh, for your indulgence. Uh, um, picking up, as I say, at the end of Canto 32. 
After we left him, I saw two together, frozen so close in one hole, that the head of the one was like a hood upon the other. I stood and watched, watched the higher one embed his teeth in the other's nape and brain, and eat the way a starving man devours bread. Not even Tydeus in his savage heat gnawed Menelippus' head more passionately than this one did to the skull and the soft meat. Oh, you who show such wild hostility, attacking him with bestial violence, tell me why, I said. And if it seems to me that you are justified by his offense to take some, such vengeance, then before I die in the world above, you shall have recompense, unless my tongue should wither and turn dry. He paused in his savage meal and raised his head from the one he was destroying in his fit and wiped his mouth upon its hair and said, What you ask revives a grief so desperate that its recollection tears my heart, even though I have yet to tell one single word of it. But if my words are a seed from which will grow the fruit of this vile traitor's evil fame, then I shall speak and weep while doing so. I do not know who you are or how you came among us, but from your speech you seem to be a Florentine. I should tell you that my name was Count Ugolino, and this one next to me is Archbishop Ruggieri. Now I shall explain why I am such a neighbor as you see. How I was seized and executed then, having trusted him while he betrayed and lied, there is no need to tell that tale again. But of what you cannot know, the way I died, the cruelty of it, hear what I have to say. Whether he wronged me, you may then decide. A narrow opening in the mew that they call hunger now in memory of my plight, where prisoners are still to be shut away, had shown me more than once the new moon's light when the bad dream came to me that tore in two the veil that hides the future from our sight. This man was there as the lord and master who pursued the wolf and his young cubs as they sped on the mountain that blocks Luca from the view of the Pisans. Trained hounds, lean and eager, led while Gualandi Sismondi and that other one, Lanfranchi, had been set on to run ahead. The wolves were weary after a short run, and then I saw the dogs as their sharp fangs ripped into the flesh of the father and every son. It was not yet dawn, but I no longer slept. My sons were there with me. Though still asleep, they called to me to give them bread and wept. You are cruel indeed if you can know the deep dread that I felt and not yet shed a tear. If not this, what could ever make you weep? The time of our morning meal was drawing near. My children were awake. Their dreams had stirred in each of them uneasiness and fear. From the base of the horrible tower, I now heard the door being nailed shut, and I looked into the faces of my sons without a word. I did not weep. I was turned to stone all through. They wept. And Anso Mucho spoke up when he saw my face, saying, Father, what's troubling you? I shed no tears, and I gave no answer then. And all that day and night I sat like stone until the sun lit up the world again. I calmed myself to stay them from despair. Alas, hard earth, you should have opened wide. Two more days passed while we sat silent there. And when it was the fourth day, Garo cried, Father, why don't you help me? I watched him fall outstretched before my feet, and there he died. Just as you see me now, I saw them all between the fifth and sixth days, one by one, drop down and die. Now blindness cast its pall, and for two more days, I crawled from sun to sun, calling to them, 
who were already dead. Then fasting did what misery had not done. With eyes asquint, having finished what he'd said, as a dog attacks a bone, he turned back to his gnawing of the other's wretched head. Again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, if there are any among you who have an apparently limitless appetite for this sort of thing, I'll be glad to. <laughs> yes? Do a little Italian so that we can hear your verse. I'm not really the one to do it. Is there anyone here who is fluent in Italian? Um, I guess as, now is as good a time as any to, to make uh, the confession that I don't really speak Italian. Uh, I didn't learn Italian when I was young. Italian was the language that uh, our parents uh, spoke when they didn't want us to know uh, <laughs> what they were saying. Um, in my late 20s, in the middle 1970s, uh, at the time of Alex Haley's roots, uh, I began to feel somewhat deracinated, and I suppose to be itching to discover my own roots. Uh, I decided that the, the best way to teach myself Italian uh, would be to find some nice little poet uh, who hadn't been translated and <laughs> cut my teeth that way. And uh, I did discover uh, Guido Gozzano uh, and spent some years doing the translation, which was uh, ultimately published. And, uh, you know, I, I've just been uh, doing it ever since. And uh, I guess I feel, as, as Jules Pfeiffer has uh, a character say in one of his classic strips, uh, when he tells about how he had uh, gone down to a publisher's office um, talking about it in his field jacket, talking about his days as a truck driver and a cow puncher uh, and so on and so forth and had been given an advance to write his memoirs uh, and the last panel leans over uh, to the, the viewer and says, one of these days they're going to catch up with me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so I, I'm afraid that if I attempted it, I would butcher uh, the Italian as much as I... So it I would really be unfair uh, to Dante to put my Italian uh, up against my English, but is there anyone who could do a more creditable performance uh, and fulfill this entirely reasonable request? It should be the first nine lines that you do. Well, that someone reads. <laughs> uh, so if there are no takers, uh, I'll obviously risking winding up in hell myself for this <laughs> someday. <laughs> Here are the first nine lines of Canto One in something vaguely resembling Italian. <laughs> Nel mezzo del cammin de nostra vita mi ritrovai per una selva oscura che la diretta via era smarita. Ai quanto a dir qual era e cosa dura esta selva selvaggia e aspra e forte che nel pensiero rinnova la paura. Tante amara che poco è più morte Ma per trattare del ben che vi trovai, dirò dell'altre così che vi scorte. Um, uh, well, uh, I think that's Dr. Johnson's dog walking on its hind legs. Uh, it has not done well, but the wonder is that it has done it all. <laughs> oh, um, yes? Two questions. First, I wonder what you think of the Hollander translation. I, I have to say I've taken a vow of something resembling silence. <laughs> I'll explain why briefly. Uh, when, my, when my translation was published uh, early in 2002, uh, some friends very kindly arranged a public presentation of it in New York. And uh, after I had talked about it and read some passages from it, and I was taking questions from the audience, and, and one of the questions uh, talked about the Chiardi translation and referred to it as underappreciated. Uh, and I began my response by saying, I don't think Chiardi is underappreciated. Now, what I meant was, uh, as I suggested before, uh, it, it's, it was acclaimed when it was published. It's held its place as the translation of choice. Um, Charity himself boasted that he made a million dollars from his Dante translation. 
Uh, it's available in at least three separate editions now. It's never been out of print in the 60 or so years since it was first published. And if that's under appreciation, uh, where can I get some? <laughs> now, I should have said that, uh, but simply, uh, as soon as I said, I don't think uh, charity is underappreciated, a kind of an ooh, what he said <laughs> murmur uh, went through the audience, and I felt as if I had farted in church. <laughs> so um, it, it dawned on me at that moment, uh, as I'd never realized it before, that uh, in my adult life up to that point, people had uh, asked me what I thought of various translations of Dante's Inferno. Uh, and I had told them, and uh, that was fine. I, I was just some guy giving his opinion uh, on the subject. But once I had my own horse in the race, obviously that changed everything. And rightly or not, even though my opinions were the same ones they'd always been, uh, now people see some sort of a personal dynamic playing out uh, in my views of the other uh, translations. Um, Charlie himself uh, said in his preface to his Purgatorio, um, when I compare my translation to Dante's original, I feel sad. When I compare my translation to the other translations, I feel happy. <laughs> now, I don't know that I'd necessarily go that far myself, but... I think um, many of the translations, particularly the well-known ones, uh, have considerable merit. Uh, I'll say this about the Hollander. Certainly, um, you'll get more understanding in terms of the background, the notes, uh, etc., uh, of the full range of Dante's achievement uh, in that one volume uh, than you will in any other single uh, volume edition, including mine. Um, but the translation really makes no attempt uh, to reproduce the, um, the, the metric of the poem, which was my principle, not exclusive by any means, but was a principal uh, concern of mine. Uh, the translation was done by Jean Hollander, uh, whose husband Robert is, of course, a preeminent uh, Dante scholar, uh, and he did the apparatus. Um, I, I, obviously, I feel that his interest was more in the annotations uh, than it was in... Uh, in the poem itself, but clearly uh, I think that um, Jean Hollander was under considerable constraint uh, because given her husband's scholarly interest, she um, had to produce a literally faithful translation uh, at every turn. His concern is uh, intensively upon the meaning, the literal meaning uh, of the poem. Uh, and not upon its poetic, as he might see them, embellishments. Uh, so therefore, um, as I say, I think she was operating uh, under considerable constraints, and within those constraints, uh, I think uh, in many ways she did an admirable job. And I'll stop there. <laughs> and your other question. Uh, the, the fact that has been said often, I don't know if it's a real fact, but I said that everybody reads The Inferno and nobody uh, gets to the paradisio. Too good. That, that, that it is unread, sort of. Well, of course, we're much more interested uh, in, in vice uh, than we are in virtue. <laughs> Just as, you know, for this, I think it's, it's true for the same reasons when, when people complain, uh, why is the news all about uh, war and violence and, and all kinds of terrible things uh, instead of about kittens being rescued from trees? <laughs> that obviously, um, when life goes on normally, uh, when people are not murdered, um, that's not news. And I think in that sense, there's a lot more news in the Inferno than there is in the, the Purgatorio or the Paradiso. Uh, interestingly and ultimately ironically, um, when I was uh, on the verge of having my translation accepted by Norton, uh, one final precondition was uh, that I had to assure them that I was willing, if they so desired, to also translate the Purgatorio uh, and the Paradiso, which uh, I uh, assured them I would be happy to do, if called upon. Uh, and then, ironically, after the translation of the Inferno had been published, uh, and I asked the, my editor uh, about their interest in the Purgatorio, uh, I was told they had no interest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that they had done a little uh, testing of the waters, uh, they had discovered that uh, W.S. Merwin's translation for all of his Pulitzer Prize and Poet Laureateship 
had not really sold. Uh, and that much worse than that, you can't give the paradiso away in boxes of cereal. So, um, <laughs> therefore, um, they had no interest. Uh, and again, obviously, th there is much more of the things we've been talking about uh, in the Inferno than there is in the other two cantiki. Uh, that is, uh, action, violence, uh, sensationalism, and also, I think, human drama uh, and um, passion. There's some of that uh, in the Purgatorio, but in increasingly less so uh, as the poem goes on. And, of course, it's very hard uh, to wring any drama uh, out of the Paradiso, uh, which is, after all, a state of stasis uh, and perfection. So, um, obviously, uh, the Inferno is by far the most popular. Uh, and uh, all considerations of the... Uh, and, and there's brilliant writing throughout uh, all three parts uh, of the Commedia. Uh, but I think pound for pound, obviously, the most interesting, the most exciting, the most moving component is the first one, uh, the Inferno, and of course, statistically, uh, the number of translations, and uh, as the good people at W.W. W. Norton and company will be the first to tell you, the sales uh, reflect that fact. Yes? Uh, the question I have isn't very scholarly, it's more one of curiosity. Uh, a few years back, and maybe some of the other folks here have read it, it was a mystery by Robert Pearl called The Dante Club. And uh, the center of it was about Longfellow having a weekly get-together with his scholarly friends in which he shared with them a portion of his translation for their reaction and perhaps to determine whether he should go back to the drawing board or not, I don't know. And it made me curious as to whether that had actually happened or whether it was just a device on Pearl's part to, uh, to uh, involve other characters in the mystery. No, that's true. Uh, he, he did a great deal of research, and in fact, that, that is accurate. Longfellow did have a circle of friends um, who would meet at his home, uh, and he would read them uh, passages, and, and they would have lively discussions. In fact, a good deal of his annotations to the poem grew out of these meetings, as well as his revisions of, of his translation. Um, it's a very entertaining read. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, uh, Matthew Pearl's uh, novel, The Dante Club, uh, in which people are being murdered in uh, Cambridge and Boston in the 1860s in ways that resemble uh, some of the, uh, the incidents in the, uh, in the Inferno. Um, as you may or may not be aware, uh, Longfellow uh, undertook that translation in the, in the first place for rather tragic reasons. Um, his, uh, he was widowed uh, as a young man in his 20s when, when his wife uh, became ill and died suddenly. Uh, he remarried some years later, and in uh, 1861, um, when they were in their 50s, uh, she was one day writing letters and uh, melting the wax uh, for a seal, uh, and the flimsy summer frock she was wore wearing caught fire, uh, and Longfellow rushed to uh, assist her uh, to beat out the, the flames, and was himself badly burned uh, in the process. Uh, his hands uh, were severely burned and, and were bandaged thereafter, and in fact his face was burned uh, to the extent that he wasn't able to shave comfortably, and this was when and why he grew his famous beard. Um, he was so in himself so injured uh, that he was unable to attend his wife's funeral uh, several days later, but he found himself uh, in a state of grief and numbness, uh, as you would expect, for a considerable period of time. He had young children um, to care for on his own, uh, and he found uh, the writing of original poetry to be too painful uh, a prospect, so he sought to lose himself uh, in translation uh, as a distraction uh, and, and undertook uh, a large-scale work uh, that he considered a great masterpiece that had not been given its due in English, namely uh, Dante's Commedia. But uh, again, though, uh, in terms of your question, that this is indeed historically based. But of course, needless to say, uh, Longfellow and Lowell and Holmes and the others did not go running around uh, Boston <laughs> solving murders. 
uh, any more than there are vampires in Jane Austen. <laughs> or is it zombies? <laughs> it certainly attracted wonderful illustrators, and I think the library just recently got a Seymour Chast uh, version uh, of the Inferno. Do you have any thoughts about the illustrators and... Well, of course, everyone has seen and been frightened as a young person by the Gustave Doré uh, yes. illustrations, uh, I'm sure, uh, which are frequently reprinted um, with the Carey uh, translation. Uh, and uh, William Blake, as you may know, also did so, some illustrations uh, to Dante, and uh, there have been a, a number of others along the way. I haven't seen the Seymour Twast ones, uh, though I'd certainly like to. Um, it is a poem, clearly, that lends itself uh, to illustration. Um, what was the, the cologne? Uh, some of you may remember this some years ago. Canoe, was it? Uh, but there was a, actually, the cologne was called, of course, it was called Dante. Uh, and uh, on the label of the cologne, there was a picture not of Dante, but of Lord Byron. <laughs> and, and when... Um, they were asked why this was so. The response was, uh, Dante was a very ugly man, <laughs> or words to that effect. And of course, everyone's familiar with uh, the illustrations of Dante with the laurel crown and, of course, uh, a nose that looks as if it could open a beer can. So um, I suppose that, uh, as I say, there have been very... Uh, vivid and excellent illustrations over the years, D Doré's more than anyone's. Um, and there's certainly a poem for all the reasons we've been discussing that lends itself uh, to illustration. But at the same time, it does seem a bit limiting that uh, I, for one at least, w would rather see my version of Dante in my head rather than Gustave Doré's. <laughs> Uh, when I think about the poem, but uh, but nonetheless, um, as you say, it has inspired uh, many excellent illustrators to to bring some of its uh, more graphic scenes uh, to life. Yes. As the person who believes that God's too good to send anybody to hell unless they really insist, I have gotten the impression over the last few years that most of the brimstone and hellfire stuff that we've been exposed to all our lives is really more Dante than biblical. Do you know <laughs> about the accuracy of that? Uh, there's probably something to that. Uh, although, ironically, yet again, uh, as you, you no doubt are aware, uh, again, despite the illustration, a uh, very handsome design uh, of this translation that Norton uh, provided me with, uh, as you're probably aware, at the end of the inferno, it is not fire, but pace, Robert Frost, ice right. uh, that predominates. The, the center of hell, where the, the worst offenders are. Um, and, and the worst offenders of all time are, the envelope please, d does anybody recall? Right? Judas, Brutus, and Cassius. Um, which may seem rather odd to you, to elevate... Uh, Brutus and Cassius uh, to the level of Judas. Uh, you would think that their victims had not much more in common than their initials. But um, uh, obviously, uh, Dante is making the point that uh, both spirit, that these were the, the men who were the greatest uh, traitors to both spiritual and temporal uh, authority. Uh, and this is where Dante um, winds up in the, uh, the Ghibelline versus Guelph yeah controversy that, uh, that runs like a fault line uh, through the poem, uh, that as opposed to those uh, who saw the emperor as, I'm sorry, the pope, uh, as uh, a, a temporal power as well as a spiritual one, uh, Dante believed actually uh, in the separation of church and state, uh, felt that the uh, the Pope uh, and everyone else should render unto Caesar uh, the things that were Caesar's, in this case, the Holy Roman Emperor. So, um, but I, I would agree, I think, that, that uh, a good deal of our sense of um, hell and its horrors comes more from Dante uh, than it does from the Bible. Uh, as you know, of course, any program on uh, the Learning Channel or Discovery or... Um, 
the History Channel or any other that has to do with how hell has been imagined over the course of Western civilization. Uh, it would be unimaginable uh, that such a program would not make prominent uh, mention uh, of Dante's Inferno. Yes? Sparked a thought in my mind that, that the translations keep coming yearly. I, I, you said in English, uh, uh, and, and I wasn't sure or, uh, if that was in the U.S. or in, uh, in England, but we do have a, a very strong tradition in this country of uh, uh, hellfire and damnation kind of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, would would Dante be as popular in uh, Norway or in Germany or, or places where they don't have that strong you're going to hell and all the torments of hell that we that seems to play a prominent part in, in, in our mm -hmm. culture? Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a particular American fascination with this uh, the work or, or, or not? I have never thought about it, but I think you may very well be onto something. There have been many fewer translations in Britain uh, in recent years than in the United States, of course, partly because the population of Great Britain is only a fifth or a sixth uh, of that of the United States. But so I don't think that the you know, the per capita inferno production uh, is equivalent. <laughs> um, many um, British translations continue uh, to follow rhyme and meter. There was one in particular uh, done by a British poet, who again. Uh, I think it, the decent thing would be not to name, but, um, but now I saw this tipped far overboard in the opposite direction. What I wanted to do in my own translation uh, was not to supplant all the virtues that most American translators preserve by eliminating rhyme and meter, but to retain them at the same time that I retain the rhyme and meter, to try to keep the same balance that I perceive Dante to have kept. But this particular translation, uh, by a, a published poet, uh, one with a number of books to his credit, um, really sacrifices every conceivable literary value, um, <laughs> including accuracy in places, just to keep the rhyme and meter. And uh, now it makes a fetish of rhyme and meter in a way that I never would. Uh, I think it, you know, I, I would hate to be accused uh, of prizing the form of the poem over other. Uh, of its constituent parts, but this is a translation uh, that I think does so. Uh, other British translators uh, in recent times have been uh, more balanced, more nuanced uh, in their approach to translating the poem, but there have indeed been many fewer of them. Uh, and I think you may very well be right that ours is not necessarily to say uh, that people read Dante for moral guidance or spiritual inspiration. Uh, yes, uh, and because it does, as you suggest, uh, it speaks to, it, it plays into uh, certain um, elements of, that historically, if not uh, in a contemporary sense. Because I would tend to think that the, the people who read the Inferno and the people who literally believe in hellfire and damnation in the United States these days are not significantly overlapping constituencies. <laughs> but, um, but because we do have a culture that, uh, that is more thoroughly imbued uh, with this sort of thing uh, th than other Western societies, we may be more receptive to it. Uh, I, I really don't know, but I would venture to guess, certainly not at the fanatical pace that, uh, that we seem to be doing nowadays. Again, I think we have to be careful to distinguish. I don't know anyone, I've never known anyone, who has gone to the Inferno for moral guidance uh, or spiritual comfort or sustenance or anything like that. That, that people read it for, for literary reasons, uh, obviously. Uh, and it, the, the problem of belief. Uh, which is a literary concept that gets kicked there. It's, it's, it's locker room bull session uh, talk on a literary level. The so-called problem of belief being, of course, uh, to what degree is and or should uh, your appreciation of a work of literature um, related to whether you, you know, agree 
That was what it has to say. Uh, in Dante's case, it seems largely irrelevant because I don't think you need to be uh, a practicing Christian uh, or, or a Christian or, or a believer at all uh, to appreciate the poem. Um, so, but, but the culture uh, is uh, just as I would imagine there are many more books about trolls and elves published in Sweden than there are in the United States uh, that they very well help explain uh, the popularity of Dante translations in America. Yes? Like one of the main things that Dante is, needs to learn from uh, Inferno is, is the importance of, um, of uh, like a lot of people in Inferno make excuses for themselves, um, you know, and don't acknowledge the fact that they have sinned. Um, and that's why they're there. That's the difference between them and people in Purgatorio mm -hmm. that, you know, have, you know, want to be cleansed. You know, they're, they're like, well, you know, I just did what I did and that's that, you know, kind of thing. Um, and I think, like, like you made the point of, um, you know, sometimes Virgil will, will drive, try to drive that home to him like he, he shouldn't feel compassion, like when he feels compassion for, um, I forget the characters' names, but the, the, one, the ones in the adultery. Paolo and Francesca. Yes. Mm. Um, like he kind of like, you know, buys their story, you know, and feels sorry for them. And Virgil says, you know, well, they're, you know, hanging out, reading, you know, this romance story, you know, and mm -hmm. what, what do they think was going to happen, you know? Um, so I think that's an important point. Mm. You know, that and, and I think you touch on, on something there that, you know, had I thought of it, uh, I would have certainly included it in the presentation. Uh, you're very uh, right that there is a, a very variety and range uh, among the sinners that Dante encounters. The poem does not become predictable. Um, if everybody he met said, you know, I screwed up, I messed up, and, and God dumped all over me, and he was perfectly right to do so, I'd have done the same thing in his place, uh, it would get tedious. Uh, but you never know what kind of an attitude uh, the sinners are going to display. Some, as you say, continue to make excuses for themselves, even in their damnation. Uh, one, at least, Vane Fucci, the thief, goes so far as to make obscene gestures uh, at God and to say, take these, they're meant for you. Um, and yet there are others, of course, who say, you know, I... I, I deeply regret what I did. It was terrible. I made a mistake. So um, there is range and variety uh, among the souls that he encounters, and, and that uh, keeps the poem from becoming too predictable and, and keeps us interested. And of course, it also is a testimony to Dante's understanding of and portrayal of the range uh, of human nature and uh, human possibility. So I think it's very much so. I just wondered if the Italian that Dante wrote in and modern Italian is significantly different, such as Middle English and contemporary English. Yes, but to not as great a degree, uh, I would say. Well, certainly, um, I, I guess the comparison to Chaucer is a fair one. Uh, you can read Chaucer uh, in the Middle English uh, in a way that you can't read Beowulf, or, or even actually Chaucer's contemporary, Sir Gawain in the Green Knight, uh, a poem written uh, not in London uh, with its French influence, but uh, in the north of England, uh, in which the language still much more resembled the language of, of Beowulf. Um, so uh, certainly um, Dante's Italian, uh, like Chaucer's English, uh, is obviously strange uh, in some ways. It's antiquated. And yet, quite readable, um, uh, without an intensive crash course, the kind of course you might need uh, to read Beowulf. It's, uh, it's a comparison that's often invoked, and I think uh, a reasonable comparison between Chaucer and Dante in that respect. Uh, I thank you very much uh, for, for being here for your interest. Thank you.